Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is Chef Hugh Carpenter and author Cindy Harris. Chef, writer, cooking teacher, Hugh Carpenter was uh, raised in Santa Barbara, went to Dartmouth, and continued his work at the University of Michigan in Far Eastern Studies. Hugh, you took a little break and went back to Santa Barbara from uh, Michigan. I think that was the beginning of your cooking career, was it? It was. It was. Uh, <laughs> I had actually uh, studied Chinese for two years as an undergraduate and also a year at University of Michigan. And as an undergraduate, I ended up eating every night at a Chinese professor's house uh -huh. with four of my classmates who were Chinese. And all each of them would cook a Chinese dish. And I quickly found that the food was really quite wonderful. And I had a great time with them. And so I would do all this cooking my junior and senior year in college and then on vacations I'd come back to Santa Barbara and practice cooking for all of our family friends and so when I decided to take a year off from graduate work I thought <laughs> what am I going to do and so all of our friends were saying oh Hugh come and open a catering company we'll hire you oh is that right and so I opened a catering company with no experience in Santa Barbara and uh, cooking Chinese dinners in the homes basically of all of our family friends and my parents were horrified. Because you had so much education. I know, and my <laughs> father had spent a fortune on me at my education. I said, Dad, it's only going to be one year, I'll go back. And of course I never went back to graduate school. You're still on leave. I'm, I'm still on leave, that's right. But did you speak Chinese? Mandarin? Uh, I or? can say in flawless Mandarin, 我不会说中国话 which means I don't speak any Chinese. Oh, but how did yeah. you buy the ingredients and deal with the people that you were working with, I mean, or the shop people? Well, I, you know, I would come down to LA Chinatown and buy all the condiments and so forth, and then I would use all the fresh ingredients that were available in the various markets in Santa Barbara. So you Barbara. could just pick them out? Yes, yes. And already I was doing food that wasn't necessarily authentic Chinese food, you know, swinging things over into Chinese cuisine that you might not normally have found in the early 1970s, veal chops. You know, I do barbecued veal chops with, a, with an Asian sauce on it. Oh. So already I was making some little changes there. But you was started, that was pretty early because they went in the 80s, they started talking about fusion and right, uh, right. Pacific Rim cooking. Yes, yes, and, uh, but I was already doing a little bit of that. But I was heavily influenced by Wolfgang Puck and a lot of the, the more innovative, up and coming young uh, Los Angeles chefs who were heavily influenced by the large Asian population. I mean, L.A. County in 1980 had two million Asians living in L.A. County. Oh, so that was, that was Wolf's uh, influence, It really too, was. Well. It was really, this was a unique area in the United States with this oh, big, multi-ethnic Asian population base that had a big influence then on American chefs as they were coming up. Oh, I see. Yeah, and so the whole idea of fusion food really this LA was really sort of the epicenter of it. That was really the genesis of it that then spread out to New York and Miami and all these other areas around the country. Did you cook down here then too? From well, Santa I, Barbara? I, I eventually came down here and began teaching Chinese cooking and, and, and other types of cooking in, in many places, including a wonderful place that used to be on uh, Montana Avenue called Montana Mercantile. You know, I was going to say, your, cu your catering then led you into to teaching. Yes, yes. I, I found that I enjoyed communicating and talking about food and trying to get people to go back into their kitchen and do the cooking uh. versus going into their kitchen and doing all the cooking for them. Well, you're not going into the kitchen, yes. I see. Well, when you were at Dartmouth, did you ever think you were going to be doing cooking? No, I thought I'd be teaching Chinese history on a college level somewhere. Oh, that was what you so, had planned to do. So it was really sort of what I might call sort of a chance sequence. Yeah. <laughs> that I started catering and I thought, I'm not going back to graduate school. And then I was given the opportunity to begin teaching cooking in various organizations in Santa Barbara and around California, and I segued out of the catering business into being a cooking teacher. Well, that's how that came about. And then um, from teaching, 
you went into cookbooks, I guess. Well, yes, when I met my wife, I, I used to take a lot of trips in, in the 80s to the, to the Far East. Uh, I took oh. groups to shop and to dine. Did you really? And we traveled all through the Far East with wonderful groups. Had you, you'd been there a lot, and so I'd you knew. I've been there so many times. And you, I understood the and language. Yes, and yes. And so then Terry signed up with one of LA's top food stylists. Terry Sanderson. My wife. The photographer That's right. of these great fast fish, fast entree, fast everything, and <laughs> fast appetizers. And, uh, and so Terry took a trip that I led to China and uh, we uh, got to know each other well. I thought, gosh, Terry's such a fantastic person. He's just such a fantastic photographer. And in the end, it's just sort of by chance again, we fell madly in love and married. And it was when we married that Terry said, because I had been trying to have a book published for oh, so I many see. years. I have four, over 40 rejections from <laughs> publishers on, on And now my, you have over 40 books. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. And so <coughs> Terry said, you know, you've really got to work, rework this. You know, it's really, she, you know, she was looking at it from an artist and a photographer's point of view, seeing how really drably presented the material was. Oh, I see. I and see. so that's we started working on the books then, and our first book, of course, was uh, you know, Pacific oh, sh Flavors. Should I hold this up? Which came out in, in April. And this was uh, nominated for a James Beard and Award. Won actually an award uh, as Best Asian Cookbook of the Year in 1988. Is that right? And uh, these books are so heavy. Yes, yes, it was uh, sold hundreds of thousands of copies, and was really it's really <coughs> been our big, big most notable book that we've done. Well, you got into the books you got into doing mm -hmm. the books and then you started something called Camp Napa Culinary. Camp Napa Culinary because we decided in the late 80s that we'd like to live in an area that had a little more rural feeling than <coughs> Los Angeles and so we thought we're better to locate than Napa Valley where all the great restaurants were opening and all the wonderful wineries right. and so forth and so we moved up there about 1990 and I r opened a camp which is just a cooking camp for people who want to have fun for home cooks and wine collectors. They come up for six days. I do six of these six-day programs a year. This is our 14th year of doing this. How do they find you? Uh, on my webpage, hughcarpenter.com, but also it, I do so many uh, public events around the country that they hear me talk about this at I public see. events. And, and then so many come back because every year I change the program completely. So, oh, I see. So people come back. It's, uh, some people, I think, don't actually graduate, but they come back also. Even though they don't have yes. to graduate because yes. this is just teaching them how to cook. You we go just through, get together, you have a kitchen. Yeah, we get together in a great big country kitchen, so we all break up into teams and work on recipes. And then we have a wonderful lunch hosted by the owners of the winery or the owners of the estate. And then the oh, and then I they see. have all afternoon free. And then in the early evening hours, we meet at a place like Molly Chapelet's and the Chapelet family will entertain us and a chef will make little appetizers and we'll drink uh -huh. old Chapelet wines and watch the sunset behind Lake Hennessy. Oh. It's depressing. It it's is. Very it depressing. sounds horrible. James Beard, I know, always gave um, awards to chefs. I didn't know that they did cookbooks, too. Yes, yes. The James, Board, the, uh, James Beard Society has been very active in the last 20 years. Uh, get, uh, giving uh, cookbook awards I to outstanding cookbooks. Yes, yes, it's a much sought after prize. And another place that really is a food place is Sur La Table, and you teach yes, there. Yes, I teach all over the country for Sur La Table. This is a sort of a fantasy huh. cookware shop of many, many thousands of square feet with the most amazing cooking merchandise. And as one of, one of your guests was saying, you know, her husband goes out to the hardware store on Saturday, but she heads down to Sur La Table. <laughs> and uh, it's really quite, they're really a quite an amazing company because they've really raised America's appreciation and knowledge about what good cookware is. Well, you were teaching down here because you live in St. Helena. Yes. No, do you live in St. Helena? Well, we Oakville. Live, no, in Oakville and, yeah. Oakville. So you're down here from the Napa Valley and you were teaching. Can you show us this, hold this up to the camera well, we're and doing tell us about this? Well, we're doing a wonderful, wonderful uh, barbecue, a wonderful barbecue uh, class down here in, in all through Southern California for Sur La Table. And this is barbecued. Salmon. One little thing I do here, Joan, on this is I actually lay the, I put the lemons on the barbecue. Oh, directly so they on, get juicy. on the direct heat. Then I put the salmon down on top of the lemons, close the barbecue lid for 10 minutes. Ah. Then when the, these stick to the grate, and when I take the salmon off, when you bite through the salmon, at the bottom of the salmon is a taste of lemon. What's the, on top, and well, what you kind know, that's of sauce? A, that's a secret. <laughs> it yeah. looks green to this me. This actually has uh, green onions and a little bit of minced ginger and a little bit of soy sauce and sesame oil. Oh, so. Very, very simple, slight Asian flavor to it. So everyone can do that. 
Yeah. Would you use this? Well, Would you this use is this a fantastic, with the salmon or yes, not? Yes, you could. This is a tartar sauce in which I put in my tartar sauce Grand Marnier oh. and grated orange and chili sauce and ginger and chopped cilantro. So the Grand Marnier has the orange taste yes. and you put the fresh orange in it. Yes, yes. Plus a little bit of ginger and a little bit of your favorite hot sauce and a little bit of your favorite chopped herb. The ginger is always hard to slice or cut or, or peel. What do, you, do you have to peel it? You have someone else do it for you. <laughs> no, no. Actually, you know what I use, which they sell at Cerulotab, is they have a fantastic little micro grater. Yeah. And you just lay the grater on the table and grab the ginger root without peeling it. No peeling. Just wash it carefully. I see. And just go back and forth, and in a few seconds, the pulp comes out on the underside. Oh, that's what I need. Yeah. Now, tell, I can't lift this. Here, here, here. Oh, can this you is, lift it? This okay. is halibut. All of course, oh, all so fish. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so white. And all fish, though, it has to be sparklingly fresh. You can't create a great fish dish without fresh fish. I see. And so this is beautiful Pacific Northwest, freshly line-caught halibut. And I put just dried fruit around the outside. Are they cranberries? You know, cranberries and and uh, Bing cherries with a little with a little bit of seasonings, and in a baking pan. And then I just bake it in a 350 degree oven until the fish gets cooked. And it has the fish is just lightly salted and peppered. That's it. And you have this wonderful fresh fruit taste to this I know. nice, very, very moist fish that comes so, out of the oven. But it must cook very quickly. How? It takes about 10 minutes. That's it. But does and the fruit cook also with it? Actually, what I did was I simmered the fruit first in a I little see. bit of white wine. Oh, how soft. delicious. I'm glad I found your secret. <laughs> <laughs> and then on top is cilantro. And, and here is, uh, actually this is flat-leafed Italian parsley, but it could be cilantro or basil or tarragon. Oh, that looks fabulous. You know, and I think fish is meant to be handled simply and quickly. And do you still cater? Oh, no, no, I gave that up in the 70s. No, I, I, and what about food TV aspirations? Do you have any of those? Well, I have tried off and on. You know, the difficulty is, is not getting the station. The difficulty is getting the advertising dollar. Uh, the advertising it. dollar is really, really tough. There are over 100 cooking shows. It's amazing, yes. isn't it? Because yes. we all love to eat. Yes, and so all of those people like Mark Nyan, who's a friend of ours, all these people are competing for that really fairly limited advertising dollar. Oh, I see. That's very interesting. Yeah. And well, I enjoy the personal contact. With, the, with your yes, uh, give and take. culinary, Camp Napa culinary, yes. and going to uh, those different places yeah, to teach. Yeah. Well, you are a great teacher. Well, we had you. to catch up. We had to, we had chase to, me down. Yeah, we had to yeah. chase you down to get a few of those things. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for having me on the show. And thanks for watching Hugh Carpenter. Don't go away because we'll be right back with Cindy Harris, who's going to teach us how to clean house. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guest, author Cindy Harris, was born and raised in the Philippines. She went on to earn a degree in history from the University of Denver and a master's in psychology from Cal State Northridge. Cindy's been uh, an interior designer, she's written screenplays, and is the author of Keeping House. Let's start with your story in the Philippines. How did you get there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, Joan, you know, I honestly feel that, that, that uh, it became the genesis. My experience was in the Philippines is the genesis of this book. Of Keeping, Keeping House, House? Of Keeping House. Because um, I, I was born over there, and then a, a couple of months later, uh, my family, my family, Americans who came over from, you know, um, America, um, were trapped by Pearl Harbor. And all the American civilians, and I must, must stress that this was civilians, this was, these were not military people, were uh, incarcerated in two Japanese uh, prisoner of war camps. So that's where you were? And that's where, that's where I was. And you know, I do not have a memory of that actually. My grandmother, God bless her, gave me my whole story. But what I do believe with all my heart is that there is a cellular memory of filth, you know, oh, can uh, you, do you feel oh, like yes. you feel the falcus in the background? always been a neat freak, always. And she said even when I was a little girl, things had to be just sort of just so. So uh, I think it was sort of the genesis of this, if you want to know the truth. What was your family doing there? Uh, he was uh, actually a mining engineer. Oh, and I his see. family had lived there, and it was his home, frankly. Oh, I see. All Americans. I see. So it was not peculiar for your family, but 
it was being peculiar to be in a Japanese internment yes, camp. Yes, yes, yes. My grandmother came over there for the, I was raised by my grandmother. It's, it's actually a whole story, very tragic in, in many ways. My grandmother from Denver, Colorado went to see her baby who was only 20 years old, my mother, oh, and I uh, see. for the birth of, my, of me and my, my you, twin brother. You have a twin brother. I have brother. a twin brother. I know, I have twins too. Oh, there, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's such a hoot being a twin. But, um, you know, he, she came over there for the birth, and shortly after, uh, my uh, mother, my real mother, uh, went out to dinner with my father. Their first date after the birth, you know, where you all get all dressed up and you go for dinner. And they were in Baguio because he was a mining engineer there. And um, she was killed in a car accident. Oh she my never, gosh, she you never were just home. a child, baby. Uh, my father had to come home and tell my oh. grandmother that she'd lost her child. Oh my gosh. So, you know, uh, she packed us up. She was trying to get us off those islands because she made a promise. She made a promise to her daughter that I will always be with your babies. I'll never abandon them. Oh. So there she is. And she, we couldn't get visas. And finally, uh, our, our ship was to leave December 8th, 1941. That's what happened? That's what happened. Well, you're writing, I, I know you're writing a story about I this. I just finished the book. Because it's a, a sound, it gives you the chills, yes. doesn't it? Yes. And you wrote the book. Yes. And have it uh, at my agents right now as we speak. And and so it's all these ba things yeah. that your grandmother told yes. you and the experiences that were there. My grandmother was a very unique, wonderful woman. She was uh, only forty years old when she was in the Philippines. So I had a very oh. young grandmother. Very. But she had been raised on a farm, so she knew how to do everything in a house. Oh, I so see. I was blessed with, with uh, a, a, a mother who taught me how to do everything. Well, why would you go and take history and psychology? Well, I just, <laughs> I don't know, you know, see, how she, what she taught me and what is uh, part of my life is really a philosophy in my life. I really felt that everybody in this whole world needs to know why it is everything is so easy for me in terms of keeping house. <laughs> keeping house is not just about keeping your house. Keeping house is, is loving yourself, loving your house. Loving your house is loving yourself. It's an extension of who you are. So that is psycho psychological, isn't it? It is psychological. It? And I know, I know from my own life that, um, you know, we, look, we can't control what goes on outside our doors. We have, you know, the traffic the, the, uh, and, the, and the computer glitches and the bosses screaming at you, whatever. You can't control any of that. But what you can control is your home is your home. I walk into my front door and I know that I'm going to be greeted by this great big hug. It's like my kiss at the end of a hard day. Your it's, house. It's beautiful, it's serene, it's peaceful, it's clean. That's important and, and this is all about changing habits. You can do this so easily. It takes five minutes in the oh, morning. Oh, I need you. I need you so badly. Five Housekeeping minutes. is something no one wants to do. And you're so enthusiastic. The yes, idea of keeping yes. house may excites you. The idea of a paper towel you know turns you off. You know, no, you know why, Joan? I, 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 I must have a serene environment. I must live not in chaos. Uh -huh. There's chaos everywhere. So if you, if you take five minutes out of your morning and just go through the living room, Visualize how, you see it all starts with visualization. Uh -huh. It's not cleaning, it's about visualizing. Visualize how you want that room to look. Have that as the ideal, it's a photograph in your mind. When you go through, you see that the you know, newspapers, newspapers are all over the floor. Pick Maybe them up. Some, go through the room, make that quick stop, fluff those pillows, <laughs> pick up the glasses. You know, it's done. You come home and then it's, everything's neat. But how, why would a paper towel make you so excited? Or a post-it? Well, post-its are a big deal. <laughs> oh, 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 that, this she is all part. She has little, no, I do. she has this, this wonderful caddy, I do. right? Oh dear, here it is. This, this is one of the most important things you can have in terms of keeping house. This should be in your Cindy cleaning kit, and this is exactly what it is, and that's what it looks like. This is Cindy Harris's cleaning yeah, kit? that's what it is. Everything you need, and that is another really big tip. 
you need to have everything accessible. If I need Windex for my upstairs bathroom, I don't want to go downstairs to get it. It uh -huh. has to be there. These cleaning caddies are absolutely essential. So you have those upstairs, downstairs, or in under, one room, or in another room? This happens. This is sort of a, a, a portable one that I can take anywhere and everywhere all through the house. I have actual bathroom caddies that are maybe even a little smaller than this that uh, pertain just to that room. So it's all underneath <laughs> the sink. I have a little rag. So, because you know, you know, the chrome in your bathroom, if you think about your house as, as an artistic endeavor as opposed to keeping your house, the chrome are the they're jewels of your house. I Polish know you're it. so great the way you talk about these things. Other people are going, oh, drudgery. Well, that is the point. It should be a joy because it is your place. Do you feel that way about getting dressed in the morning? Yeah, you like to light up. You you like to light yourself up. Exactly. You like to look good. But exactly. you start. I love the way you start the morning. Fix your yeah. bed. You say no. No, no. Don't make your bed yet. <laughs> no, this is this is really important because you see, you know, during the night you've got all these little critters that are living in there. They love. <laughs> they love your down, down comforter. They love it. So what you do is you get out of bed. There's three ways to get out of bed. Get out of bed. Flip those covers all the way back. Uh, to, to the all end the of way the bed. Back. Open the windows. Open the shades. You give your bed fresh air. Go downstairs, have a little coffee, read the paper, go upstairs, take your shower. Then you make your bed. So they've it's done. They've left the bed. They, they're, they're gone. <laughs> they, they went bye-bye. Oh, this, I'll tell you, this is another great tip. Once a week, when, when I do my you know laundry for the for I'm going to just hold this while you're right. talking because then we can see the cover. The uh, get your pillows. If, you know, like when you strip your beds once a week, get your pillows, throw them in the dryer. Twenty minutes. Really? Yes. It'll fluff them up, but it'll also kill the mites. Any oh. kind of allergy-prone things like the dust that, that accumulates. That's what that's, that's what people interesting. Do. The other thing you talked about is flowers. How to keep fl that you should buy flowers for yourself. Yes. yes. Who, why wait for company to come over? You know, you want a beautiful place that that adds to that zen feeling of your home. That's the serenity that you're trying to create. Buy a bunch of flowers into your market. Put it in a, a vase. And if you want them to last a little longer, yeah. a bay or aspirin will really, really do Just wonders. Plop Just an plop aspirin it in. in. If you don't want to put aspirin in there, you you know, don't believe in it. Just get a little bit of bleach, tiny. Oh. Put a little bit of that in there. Household bleach. You uh, have ten golden rules. Yes. But I think you've yes. given a lot ten. of them now. Oh, I've given a lot of them now. One is the kit. The other one is the, the post-its. Post this is great, this book, because you have a space in the book where you can put, you have little pockets. Little pockets. Manufacturer's instructions, your own notes, whatever it is you want. I see this book. You know, people have asked me on, on some of the shows I've been on, you know, why did you write the book? I needed a Bible that I can go to that has everything I need to know. I don't want to search for information on how to take a, you know, a red stain out of my white sofa. That's not my intention. Everything is there. Everything is in here, I know. <laughs> and you went, uh, you, you did a cable show recently, Domestic Divas. Oh, the right. And how can you really get a mess clean? Well, the first that's what you had to yes, do, that's right? Exactly, that's exactly. This is the Modern Girl's Guide to Live. I guess I can give a little pitch for the show. It's on. It's going to be on style, but it's, um, it's. Uh, yeah, we. I had to straighten that house up. You know, she did actually. This, I had to go in and show this young girl that she's having company in 30 minutes. <laughs> and what do I do? So the first thing I had her do was pick up a great big garbage bag. And we went through that living room, oh. and I said, okay, the first thing you see is, again, this is where design comes in. Her coffee table was cluttered with magazines and books and stuff and uh, just, just junk. And I said, you go through. Three things <coughs> should be on your coffee table. Three. Because your eye <coughs> can only take in three things at once without it becoming chaotic. And this, again, is trying to create serenity in your mind, too. So we went through and we just put up, we took all these things that, that no longer were needed on that table and we put them in this, this big garbage bag. Not to throw away, oh. but to dispose of Was at a later date. Was she freaking out? 
No, no, oh, no. no. She, okay. she actually said at the end of the show, she said, you know, I actually like the way we, we finished it oh, up. She said, I'm not, I'm not going to put them back. I see. Same thing with, with the bookshelf. She had a little teddy bear on a, on a shelf. I said, it's gone. <laughs> because sometimes you become attached to you things. Do. You get like used me. to it. You get <laughs> Maybe used you get to used it. to it, yeah. yeah. You know what, Joan? This is really uh, mostly about changing habits. Changing habits transform your life. And that's what it's all about. I want to just show the cover of this little the baby book. The baby book. It's called Cleaning. Mm -hmm. And then you have another one. Laundry. Laundry. This yes. should actually go into your laundry room so that when you, get, when you have all the tips you need for laundry, everything, every kind of additive to use, so on, is all in here. I'm going to hold it up. And then um, what I'm going to ask you is what special ways do you have to clean the kitchen and the bathroom? I love the squeegee thing. Over oh, the, the bathroom. Um, yeah, they're going to be different things, but I think the squeegee is, is the best thing you can have in the bathroom. Keep it in your shower. It takes two minutes to just to whisk off that, that accumulated water on, on the tile. What happens with the water? It dries on the... And it becomes water spots. And then it solidifies, and then you really can't get it off. So it's better just to do it while it's, you know, while, while it's, it's still wet. wet. And, it, and, and that takes it off. Absolutely. And the kitchen? Stainless steel cleaner, because most of us do have stainless steel, whether it be a polish or, you know, I have some things in here that I, that I use. Whatever you find that, that is the most useful for you. But a spray and just wipe it off. And push this basket over to me because you say that, how heavy is it? Is not it bad. heavy? It's not bad. Not too bad. But you have these, you have a caddy like this in the shower? Or not you can in the keep shower. I keep, in the shower. I keep something like this, a little smaller, under the um, the, the bathroom sink. Oh, I so see. So in the shower, I actually have, and it's in here. It's and they're not. As you see, they're small. Oh, that's oh. your squee That's your squeegee. That's okay. This is your squeegee. They make them in colors now. They make them in, you know, wonderful. Oh, that's great. Oh. This is what I need. This is a great thing. This is the best. What is this? Before this is the we best. Leave. This is the best. In your toilet bowl, swish it around, it becomes blue, and oh. it falls into the water, and you flush it. Well, it's we're done. we're flood. They're flushing us out of the studio <laughs> today. Done. Thank you, Cindy, for being thank with you us. For, thank you for inviting this me. This was great. Thanks for watching Cindy Harris, who loves to clean house. And no, keep no, no, <laughs> Joan, I love to manage cleaning house. Oh, that's good, manage. <laughs> <laughs> and keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time. <laughs> I like to manage. <laughs>